Hey team, welcome back to the Dennis Invest podcast. This is one I've been looking forward to a while with my good friend, Justin Lay, who I keep bumping into on a transient basis. And we keep saying we're going to set ourselves up to make a podcast and we've just got around to it today. Something super engaging, super exciting, how to grow your practice and also how to be more profitable as an associate as well. And a lot of the misconceptions that are out there about those subjects. Justin, how are you, my friend? I am I'm brilliant. Thank you, James. I am absolutely brilliant. Thanks for inviting me on. I've, I've been looking forward to this for some time as well. Appreciate the invitation. Dude, my pleasure. First of many. And actually, you're putting me to shame because for people who can't see the video on this podcast, Justin's podcast setup is much better than mine. So I really need to up my game. You've got all the bells and whistles and microphones there and books in the background. And what's that? What are those things called? What's the name for those stand up advertisements that you can roll out? Oh, uh, the roller banner. Roller, roller banner, roller banner. Roller I didn't banner. even know what it was flipping called. Okay, I, I really need to up my game. Anyway, it, can, it Justin, can go anywhere with you, James. That's what I love about it. I can take it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, 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 awesome. Justin, so there'll be people on this podcast who listen to this podcast who have heard of you, and there will be people who have yet to meet you. One of those yes. two categories. So for those people who have yet to meet you, maybe it might be nice for you to do a little bit of an intro. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, I'm Justin Lee. I'm the founder of a company called Focus for Growth. And we are a sales and leadership training and coaching company specializing in the dental market. Um, a really potted history, James, I'm going to do it super quick. My background, originally I was a dental technician, and then I left dentistry, went into sales, worked in sales for quite a while, selling into dental practices and, and, and dental labs, uh, and then kind of worked up to a key account manager, had lots of different roles within different organizations, then became a sales manager, and then I ended up as a business manager at 3M and, and managed lots of different businesses in and outside of dentistry. And then in 2017, I realized I wasn't enjoying the corporate world as much as uh, I had been and, and then retrained as an executive coach. So I became a, an accredited coach, started working with different clients, combination of one-to-one and program-based. And 2019, 20, a lot of my clients just through my network and relationships happened to be in dentistry. So from then, I've really specialized in the dental market for the last kind of two, three years and work with some of the suppliers to the market and with some of the kind of large practices and, and dentists who are really looking to, as you said, you know, grow their practices and increase profitability. Lovely, lovely. And we were talking just before we press the record button this podcast and we both agreed that we were going to call this podcast the true path to wealth we were thinking about a title beforehand and mm -hmm. that's because one of the things that we mentioned before we hit the record button was if you want to get to the position where you have more freedom in your life then quite often that is a money thing quite often that is the thing that's holding people back because yeah. if you ask most people why don't you drop a day in work or you drop a day in your business most will say, well, I don't want to lose, lose the turnover, right? Yes, Most will say, right. well, I don't want to lose the money, right? So then I say, ah, okay. So what you're telling me is that if you earn X amount in five days a week, that yeah. if you could earn X amount in four days a week, then actually you could have the best of both worlds, right? Yeah. And most people struggle to conceptualize that until I put it in those terms, because who mm. the hell would say no to that, right? But most people mm. would say that actually they're not that keen on or they're not necessarily focused on increasing profitability in their business if you act like not that's not a priority for everybody right no. but more freedom is a priority because who would who the hell would say no to that right so working mm -hmm. backwards and by extension actually increasing profitability is a priority if you wish to have more time off and have more freedom in your life which is yeah. why this stuff is going to be flipping interest in the day thoughts on yeah. that what i've just said I, I love the way you've described it james because you you and i beforehand talked about that being a mindset issue actually if somebody doesn't believe that's possible in the first instance, they won't even attempt to achieve it. And actually, it's not until you've explained it where people, I'm sure people listening to this are going to think, oh, I've not really thought about it like that. And I know this is something that you work with your clients on and, and you talk about a lot. But until you embrace that as a principle, there, there's no way you're going to go about achieving it. And I'll tell you the other thing that's interesting, you know, as people start to grow their practices, they don't always think, actually, if I can grow to the level that I'd achieved in five days in four, I could take a day. They tend to take the growth and keep working the five days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. that is the challenge. That's the challenge, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, this is the thing, right? And the, the beautiful thing is that you have the option to do that. Yes. Rather than you feel like you have to because you want yes. to hit a certain level of income. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Um, 
boom right and you can continue to some people no matter how much they earn they'll always work seven days and that's cool okay but the yeah. point is you shouldn't feel that you have to out of necessity ah yeah. that's a different thing totally choice. totally should be a choice it that, that be, makes I... the flipping hairs in the back of my neck stand up bro <laughs> see, honestly only that gets me so fired up right and i yeah. could go off on a huge tangent monologue about that but it's a 50 50 podcast today it's not the gym show it's the gym <laughs> show. So, so in that spirit justin in that spirit let's talk about some of the misconceptions i suppose that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis so the yeah. dentist the, the things that hold people back maybe the limiting beliefs or the the technical know-how that dentists need in order to boost their profitability yeah yeah Let, let's start with the first one james we, we have talked about this before the podcast so there's this huge misconception and it's not, I have to say, it's not unique to dentistry. Uh, the, the huge misconception is that people think the more clinically and technically competent they get, and then the more they're able to explain that clinical and technical competency to someone else, i.e. the patient in the instance of dentistry, but in other businesses, it might be to customers. You know, the more I know about what we do, the more I, the more I can explain it in, in graphic detail. There's this misconception that that's going to convert and influence people more effectively. And actually what it does is has the reverse effect. It starts to tune people out because not everybody wants to know the finite detail of everything. So you have to really understand the person in front of you, be that a patient or a customer, what level of information do they need to make the right decision? And then you have to match that level of information with what you deliver. And if you're giving people too much, actually, sometimes it can it can be a real turnoff. And, it, and it's a huge problem, as I say, not just in dentistry, but particularly I've noticed it in dentistry with the clients I work with. I believe that 100%. And the reason that I believe that is because I 100% used to be that guy. And my mindset was more is more when it comes yeah. to information. And oh, <laughs> what a terrible belief system. What a terrible belief system. And I look back on it and I think, wow, you could have, because here's the thing, it's about serving people, right? Yeah. And you could actually have, ser I could have served those people to a higher standard by being more deliberate about the information that I gave them rather than mm. the, the, the bundle, blunder, blunder bust. That's what those guns are called, right? Blunder yeah. bust. You know, yeah. the, the scatter gun, the shotgun approach. You yeah. Know I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. On that, naturally, you'll observe dentists doing this a lot. Mm -hmm. What are the key mistakes or areas that they can improve on that you observe frequently? Like, what are what is like the specific know how or details, like the actionable takeaways that listeners could take yeah. on this podcast and implement? Yeah. So the big thing is, um, and I have a I have a really nice visual for it that um, I'll, I'll send you as a screenshot afterwards, James. You can share it with your listeners. I have this visual that just talks about the patient journey and the stages they go through as they're making a decision and then the stages of the consultation and how you can align those with where the patient is in their decision making mm. and early on in the conversation with the patient about potential treatment options you'll see that the patient kind of has this spark of interest in the discussion and that interest is uh is a really good indicator it's like your early buying signal right but when you meet that uh, spark of interest, your job then is to say to the patient, okay, so you're interested in this type of treatment. Before I tell you about it, let's just have a conversation about, you know, what you're looking for in terms of, you know, the, the treatment outcome. What, what's your current situation? How, how long have you been thinking about it? What's important to you as you consider treatment? And asking really good questions so the patient has this space to open up and tell you all about what they're looking for. And the reason that's so important is because at the same time as explaining it to you, they start to process it. And as they're processing it, they get clear on what they're looking for. And you can you know, listen, clarify, sense check. If, there, if there's a mistake, then you can say, okay, so you think it works like this. Okay, let's just talk about how that, how that actually works in practice. But you don't have to do that until they've articulated everything that's on their mind. But the other really important thing that happens is the patient starts to convince themselves it's something they want to do through that conversation. And if they don't get the chance to explain it, then they don't get that opportunity to convince themselves. And then you're the one that's got to do all the convincing and the pressure sits with you to do that. So the big mistake of you know almost over, making things overly technical and explaining in too much detail, actually the, the antidote 
is to pause when the patient's interested and instead of talk to them about treatment in too much detail, just ask them questions about what they're looking for. And when you craft those questions, and we we use this principle, we, we call them must ask questions. What are your must ask questions of the patient, depending on the treatment, depending on where they are in the inquiry? Then we make sure that those questions are asked. The patient gets to process it. They move themselves through that kind of almost, you know, convincing themselves of, of what they're looking for. You get the information you want. And from there, once the patient's had the chance to explain it, there's much less pressure in the consultation. And you can then ex explain what it is that, you'd, you, that you're proposing, because, you know, the questions are the diagnosis, right? The proposal is the treatment option. So you don't treat until you've diagnosed. And through that diagnosis process, through the conversation, you're then much more well equipped to have a conversation that's directly relevant to the patient. And it's and that actually prevents you from being too technical because you'll start to use the language the patient uses. You'll start to have a much better understanding of what they're looking for. And you can tailor the conversation to what they've told you. It's, it's quite simple, but you'd be surprised how 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 often it's overlooked or missed. And it's just about doing the simple things well, though, isn't it? Mm. You know, because inherently this is communication. Effect that this is communication, and communication Absolutely. to conceptualize is a simple thing, yeah. but to do it extremely well, the devil's in the detail. Let's say that, and you've got to know yes. this stuff, right? And here's yes. what here's what I could hear when you were talking as well, right? When you ask loads of questions, it allows you to number one understand how that patient speaks. Yep. and also allows you to understand loads about the outcome that you desire that that sorry the outcome that they desire right because yes. remember it's about them not you you're just yes. a vehicle to get them to where they want right yes. now if yeah, you're the I'm right saying. person you say yes right but you have to establish that first of all you have to establish what they want right yeah. i'm a big fan of this conceptualized benefits what do i mean by that features you've got the features of your treatment and you've got the yep. benefits Right. Yeah. But then you've got conceptualized benefits. Right. What's a conceptualized benefit? So a feature would be the crown is white. Yeah. A feature would be the filling is white. And then what that means is that no one will be able to tell that we have placed a filling in this tooth. This tooth will be returned to its natural beauty. Key line that comes next. And what this means for you is that you can smile and laugh at your daughter's wedding and you're going to look great in the photos. And you will remember that day forever because everything was wonderful and you had the perfect smile. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, the last line was what really set it off, right? Because yeah. now they can see that. What are they doing in their head? They're like, oh, yeah, geez, I'm conceptualizing it. I'm imagining it, right? But you know, to make that last little bit extra powerful, what you can do is listen to the patient, ask them why they want the, the smile, why they want the white fill in. Why now? What is it that you're hoping to achieve? Is there is there a reason that you sought us out at this very moment in yeah. order to undertake this procedure? Great question, by the way. I love that question. Right. Yeah. That's where you get so much info. OK, because they'll they, you know, specifically, why did they come at this moment? Right. Maybe it's because they've got an event coming up that they want to look good for, right? And you know, whenever they tell you that in their words, right? Remember, people don't use words. People don't, people use words unintentionally, very deliberately. And it's because those are literally the words that they think in, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. those are literally the words that they think in, right? So if you take that explanation and adapt it to use the words that that person has just used to explain the same situation to use, so easy for them to conceptualize and imagine. Mm. Right. Yeah, well, you're literally talking their language, right? You're literally talking, talking their language. We're all talking English, yeah. even though it doesn't feel like it sometimes, right? This is like next level, how we can Yeah, 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 yeah. And that is beautiful. And you can, you know yeah. what? You know when you can really see someone just like, you can tell that you've really engaged someone because they're literally looking you with, at you with like wide eyes like that. Yeah. And then you know, you're like, okay, me and this person, we're communicating, right? Mm to a really high level but you only do that when you genuinely believe you can serve them right that to me like if, if you don't think you can help them then i would say listen i don't feel this is for you perhaps you need this person perhaps you need that person right but we can yeah. only go we can only we can only use that effect when we genuinely think we can help someone yeah or and, and you know anyway. the, the the point you've raised is so so relevant james it, it really does talk to it because 
if you haven't asked those questions, then when you come to talk about whether it's features, you know, advantages, benefits, and and I love the idea of conceptualizing the, the benefit. Actually, you want to to get them to think in their minds of act, of the outcome and the result that they're looking for, and and, and what what's the occasion. But if you haven't asked the questions, you don't know. So Boom. you've got you've got to ask those questions so that you can do that conceptualizing of the benefit. I, I love that as a term. Really, really good. Really useful. And and that that for me is the that's the big miss for a lot a lot of clinicians. And I th- I think partly it might be because you know we talked about. The, the desire and the need to want to be as clinically and technically competent as possible. I think that's an admirable thing for, for most dentists to want to get to and therapists and, you know, associates, principals, but actually don't let that get in the way of you being able to communicate effectively with your patients, taking the time to understand what they're looking for, really exploring their needs, understanding why now is the right time. And, you know, the other thing I think is that's impacting this is if, if, You've got clinicians that have been used to performing NHS treatment. You tend to find that there is a there's a rush in in every procedure in every patient interaction. And as you make that migration to private practice, you've really got to factor in that that time, slow down time, create space for the consultation and the and the patient conversation. That's so important, and it doesn't come naturally when you've spent a lot of time almost on the you know, the, the hamster wheel, I guess you might call it. Well, speaking as someone who went through that process, that yeah. was literally what I thought dentistry was. Okay. Mm-hmm. Before yeah. I went to, I was like, it's supposed to be fast. It's supposed to be frenetic, mm-hmm. you know? Therefore, if that's my belief, then I'm going to behave like that yes. because I think that that's how it's supposed to be. Right. Mm-hmm. But actually it was my beliefs that need to change. And they, they can only change in the face of new evidence. Yeah, you know, when, yeah. When I when I observed that, but anyway, listen. Um, I'm very keen to hear more about the observations that you have through mm. working with dentists. So communication is up there with the thing that everybody can improve on. Yeah. Other areas that will help dentists be more profitable. Yeah. So so I mean the the communication is all about. For for me, it's all about actually starting to do more of the dentistry that you love. So if you want to focus in on the right treatment areas, you know, let's say, you know, the big couple of big areas right now, uh, and I think they will continue to be in the future, you know, clear aligner therapy, Invisalign is the market leader, but, you know, how do you make sure that you're able to, you know, make the right treatment recommendations for Invisalign patients? And a lot of the time, actually, people who will benefit from clear aligner therapy uh, it may be an aesthetic thing. It may be a function thing, but actually there's, there's a lot to be said for, you know, helping the patient to understand that's even an option because believe it or not, you know, even with all the, the PR and, and marketing that's done, not everybody is, is aware that clear aligner therapy is, is something that's possible for them. And then you think about, you know, composite bonding uh, and those, those kind of more aesthetic treatments actually is a, there's a huge demand for that in the marketplace. It's whether or not, you know, as a, as a practice team, one, one, you're giving patients confidence that you're able to 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 complete those therapies, and two, whether or not you're having the right conversation with the patient so they understand that you're capable and, and able to provide it. And I think that is the key thing. If you have certain therapy areas you really want to become a specialist in, and you know they're going to be more rewarding for you, more rewarding for the patient, and more profitable for your practice, it really does give you a, a sense of momentum and, and kind of clinical freedom. But you have to have the communication skills that underpin it as well as the the clinical skills that that's that's the combination that really does make the difference totally hear you because Mm -hmm. even though you might be technically superb if someone Mm -hmm. doesn't actually know that you offer these things or doesn't know why they're relevant to them then how can they ever proceed on that path of treatment how can you ever serve them in that way Mm -hmm. awesome so on that specifically the juicy actionable tangible things that a dentist can do to allow the patient to understand the benefits that may be offered to them through delivering that service, or even just, I guess, marketing, I suppose, raising awareness that the dentist mm-hmm. offers those services. What could dental practices do? What could dentists do to facilitate those conversations? Yeah, I think first and foremost, it is about you know making it visible in the practice. So ensuring that around the practice, you have either marketing information or uh, or posters or you know there's you can get some incredible technology now you know kind of some smile design um technology tablets 
Uh, you can you can do questionnaires before patients come in to see you. My dentist is just my, my own personal dentist has just recently started to um, use. I think they're using SOE. And prior to every appointment, you know, they ask a mini questionnaire about you know uh, my uh, uh, what is it smile confidence. So I fill out a, a questionnaire and they ask, you know, what changes would you like to make? So actually coming into my appointment, I'm already starting to think, actually, are there any things I want to change? What is it about my smile that I like? What is it about my smile that I want to change? It's really interesting that, that that just is part of that influence journey coming into the practice. And then, you know, if you attend the practice and, and there are visual reminders, posters, testimonials from patients, perhaps before and after uh, images, they're really powerful. And, and if you, you know, for dentists who haven't, you know, we're talking about investing, right? If you haven't invested in the right digital technology yet, it's definitely something that you should be considering because the ability to use, whether it's an intraoral camera or a scanner, to be able to, to start to show patients what they can't necessarily see for themselves and, and then be able to have that conversation to kind of demonstrate visually, you know, actually, this is what we're seeing. How do you feel about this? Let them talk about it. And, and let them get interactive on a scanner so they can start to blow up the image, perhaps see a before, a potential before and after. There's some great technology and tools to do that. And one of the things I advise clients to do, and I've seen a, a number of clients do it, and they do it so effectively, is to build out a library of before and after images for the different cases that you've, you've completed and start to think about how you... Um, it's segment them and categorize them so that you've got you know the right type of patient so you don't want to be showing you know a female a male's before and after so by, by you know female or male you then don't want to be showing you know a younger patient an older patient's uh detail so make sure that you've got them by kind of age category and and just the simple things that if you if you if you put a bit of structure and a bit of a plan together, actually they become really powerful tools to help your patients become more aware of what you offer them. Uh, and actually it doesn't take that much work. It just takes a bit of effort with you and your team uh, aligned to, to get it right. Thank you so much for mm, that pleasure. answer. There is some real flipping juicy stuff there, which is really good. <laughs> That's awesome. I like that. I like that thing at the end about mm. categorizing the, first of all, bothering to take patient photos. Right. Yes, and was, which is, which can be, uh, it can, it can. Well, let me be careful with my words here. It can feel like a faff, but actually, it's well worth it. And plus, you get the skills of photographer as well, which are very important. But then, yeah. what it means is it facilitates all these conversations later, and then increases treatment plan acceptance, which is the aim of the game, right? You want, yeah. you want, you want every person to come and see you in the chair, well, or ideally as much as possible, to be someone who joins you on the patient treatment mm -hmm. journey right yeah. because otherwise the chair time treat you know chair time that's filled with exams is very you know this whole podcast is about profitability and that's not the profit most profitable use of your chair time right, right? but but yeah. of course you know it's only whenever you actually genuinely feel like you can serve someone which is super yeah. important yeah let's talk yeah. about well let's super super quickly just skirt over social media uh just while we're here justin do you think yeah. that every dentist should be should be on the gram in 2023. Should be Ooh, on great question, James. Um, if, if they want to be, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, okay, and yeah, that, that would be my advice. If you're yeah. comfortable with it and you enjoy social media, you enjoy sharing your, you know, your successes with patients, then ab absolutely. But it's, I have to say, it's not for everybody. You know, some people absolutely kind of uh, despise social media, and and. I mean, I'm on social media. So, so if, if you haven't followed me, um, just Justin Lee Coach is my uh, kind of name on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and on Instagram. So I, I'm on it. I do quite a bit on on social media. I I quite enjoy it, but I'm also cautious not to let it kind of overtake my personal life and all the other commitments that I have because it is one of those time drains that if you're not careful if you don't manage it in a structured way it can start to eat away at you know your professional and personal life so you just be careful with it bro you've made such a good point mm. you're going to use it in a business sense you have to treat it like a business yeah you yeah. have to treat it like a business how does it look whenever it's a business it has to be systemized and structured mm. and not just scrolling and actually yeah. I've, i actually you've actually made a really good point there because naturally a lot of what i do is on social media so whenever yeah. i'm using it 
in the sense that I'm going on there to post something for the group or the community, then it's it's so important to have the mindset that you're going in there to be focused mm-hmm. and do that one thing and then go back to whatever it is that you're doing that needs to be productive or yes. even do it in certain hours of the day. Yeah. Another thing. So, so important. It's, you have to bookend it because if you don't, it can really take over without you even realizing. Because it, and, and you know, it's interesting. I, I was, I listened to a podcast. It wasn't a dental podcast. Um, I can't remember which one it was, but they were talking about, you know, back in the day, if you look back at the 80s and 90s before social media existed, some of the most intelligent people on the planet were designing rockets to go into space or trying to create the first computer. And nowadays, the some of the most intelligent minds on the planet work for Facebook, work for Instagram. I know it's all meta now, right? Work for LinkedIn, trying to figure out how do they keep you scrolling and on the platform. So you've got some incredibly intelligent people doing some amazing work in the background that makes you almost unconscious and and turns you kind of into a a part-time zombie when you're on social media you have to be so alert to it otherwise it will draw you in and you won't even realize you've lost 45 minutes uh, and you went on to do one thing and didn't get it done but spent a load of time scrolling so i would say you know exercise some caution be really clear and your advice is really good james go in to do something and know that you're going to get out to carry on and you know what not to be too dystopian but mm. let's take what you've just said to the next level and imagine mm. what about whenever there's AI that's created on demand, continuous content that is mm. user specific to you, to Justin, to James, yeah. to John, Jim, all these people. Yeah. That is created constantly the second that you log on to the app. Oh my yeah. goodness. Right. It's going to be a crazy world. Let's hope that that's a flipping long way off. If yeah. ever. But yeah, man, it's uh, it was chat G- chat GPT. This is, could be the like the the eventual progression of chat GPT. And I, I was listening to a mm-hmm. podcast all about this the other day, and I was like, wow, I really hope that that doesn't happen anytime soon. But yeah. anyway, straight back yeah. to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, actually, one more quick tangent because this just popped into my head when you were talking. Yeah. Favorite podcast, Justin? Oh, um, it's a tie. Uh, obviously dentists who invest podcast oh, is, thank is you. up there James, obviously <laughs> that's up there right that goes without saying but because we're on that platform i should i should give someone else a shout um, <laughs> um i love two podcasts that i go forwards and backwards the diary of the ceo with stephen bartlett mm. and high performance podcast with damien green and uh sorry damien hughes and uh, no damien is it professor Rob, uh, you know who i mean the high performance podcast damien and uh Rob, I think it is, Rob Hughes. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant, those two podcasts are absolutely amazing. Interesting. I, I'm going to say, I'm going to share my favorite podcast, Go on. but I'm going to caveat that and say it's my favorite non-dental podcast because if, if, if dentistry is in there, I don't want to step in any toes. It might be too controversial. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, anyway, favorite non-dental podcast, I really like The Game by Alex Ramosi. Oh, I, oh okay. I, I know Alex Ramosi. I, I haven't listened to The Game very cool podcast so he's the guy's like 32 and he's yeah. hit 100 million in wealth yeah. yeah and he's learned some real wisdom about business and philosophy along the way he's quite a philosophical dude and i just mm-hmm. resonate with him a lot he's got a phenomenal ability to articulate himself he's got a phenomenal ability to articulate himself it's yeah. really 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 impressive very cool podcast yeah. for anybody who hasn't listened to it well he, he was a guest on the diary of a ceo recently that's so that's uh, where i heard it yeah so he's been on he was actually yeah 100 yeah, because i heard it on diary of a ceo and then that's he right. actually published it on his like two days ago so that's actually you've just reminded me of that so thank you yeah, anyway good. anyway 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 straight back to this podcast so let's talk about outside the chair very briefly maybe more yep. along the lines of communication and teamwork mm. what are the top things that you feel dentists could do better in order to become yeah. more profitable uh it's interesting I, I mean again you know a lot of the work i do with practice teams with leaders in in practices is similar to the leaders in business so in my leadership career one of the big mistakes i made was being overly directive and i learned i learned the lesson the hard way because if you start to give people too much direction or you're you're far too management orientated in your practice or your business you will find that is uh, it's almost like a vacuum right so people will take as much direction as you give and before you know it you're trying to do your functional clinical role 
and you're trying to make sure the whole practice runs, everyone knows what they're doing, and you are kind of you find yourself torn between you know far too many tasks and far too much direction. The big light bulb for me was when I was um, I was given this leadership development opportunity, uh, kind of midway through my management career, and I was taught how to coach. So I went on quite an extensive coaching program, and that changed my entire perspective. I started to see the opportunity to really, really, instead of give people information, to kind of challenge them with questions and get them to start to think for themselves, particularly when people are coming to you for decisions. You know, what should I do about this, Justin? What should we do in this situation? And when, you, when you're when you first in a management or a leadership role, you're, you know, your practice principal, people come to you for answers. Early on, you think, okay, that's easy. So you give them the answer, give them the answer. And you know the old uh, saying, you know, to, Give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll he'll eat for life, right? Coaching is very much like that. It's about helping people to find their own sense of resourcefulness. And you, you can do that really effectively through a coaching style. So creating a pause between when someone comes to you with something and you're tempted to just go, okay, do this because you know exactly what to do. You know the answer, you've been there a hundred or maybe more times. And pressing the pause button, and saying, you know, before I answer, what do you think you should do? And give them the space to think about it. So they start to create, the, and it's really the neuroscience is interesting here, because if somebody never makes that judgment, they don't make that leap. If I keep getting answers, then my, my brain, I literally don't hardwire my brain to look for the solutions. I just look to you for answers. The minute you stop me and get me to think, there's a neural pathway that forms in my brain that starts to make decisions that starts to figure out problems but when i'm reliant and dependent on someone else for answers that never happens so in coaching and in coaching as a leadership style that's one of the big things for me if you start to think about how do you create a high performance team how do you start to elevate your practice team you have to do it one conversation at a time through a coaching approach so you start to see the direction and, and you know expectations have to be clear that goes without saying people have to know what to do but then as they start to think about their development and they come to you for you know new challenges problem solving you've got to stop so solving people's problems and get them to start solving them for themselves and that really is the transition to a high performing team because it becomes almost self managing and, and you know self directing that that is the goal set it as the goal and start acting you know in that direction that that's the important bit for me that is cool thank you <laughs> <laughs> that is cool and very, very important and it's like a self awareness thing as well because oftentimes until somebody points out that there's probably a better way of doing what you're doing yeah you don't know that it exists no. even until someone tells you you know yeah. and on that exact thing that you said a bit of a bit of ceo advice and i can't remember where i heard this from but mm -hmm. basically it was talking about unbusying yourself you know and past a certain point mm -hmm. your your organization or your enterprise gets big enough or even if you're an associate mm -hmm. you've just got so many things to do and you just have yeah. to think about how you can basically delegate things in effect yeah. Right? Yeah. and what you're talking about is delegating decisions right mm -hmm. which is cool great wonderful right so here's the thing how do you start that process what's like a practical method that i've used in the past and still do use yeah. you just write down five things that you did throughout the course of the day the five things that took the most of your time right then you yeah. think to, and this you can do this at the end of every day it's like a reflective iterative process right write down five things that took all your time right and then in each one of those things think about part of that that you could delegate or eliminate and then guess what? Pretty soon you start finding that you have more time because there's only so many times that you can do that, right? Yeah. Or you can continuously do it and then you can nice. find ways to spread the load. Very practical method that one can use in order to reduce how much time they're spending on things that realistically could be done by someone else. Mm. Love that. I, I, like I, that. I love that. This, this is what I always say to people, right? And even if, even if you can't delegate all of it, even if you can just do a component of it, yeah? Yeah. And it, you have to get really granular on it because you can't just write, you know, being in a, you know, being a dentist in a dental chair. Right. You know, you literally have to do that. Right. Yeah. But what you might do is you might say, hey, like developing the x-rays or what you might do is say, like, hey, having fun conversations or something yeah. like that. You know, so yeah. the more granular you get is the more you're able you're able, you're able to identify what tasks are going on. 
and then also figure out how you can delegate those or give mm. them to someone else or eliminate them because they mightn't be necessary or mm. automate them. Delegate, eliminate, automate. I like it. I, I like yeah, it. Those are the those are the three eights, I suppose. Delegate, eliminate, automate. Yeah? yeah. And if you if you apply that filter to those five things that you've written down, here's the thing, you mightn't even be able to do that to all of them. But if you just keep doing it every day, right? What what's the best way? People will say things like, I don't have time to do that, right? And it's like, exactly, because that's the thing that you're going to do to get more time, right? So you have to make time. <laughs> you have to make a little bit of time to, to have more time, right? You have, to, yeah. you have to spend time in the right areas, which will give you more time, right? Mm -hmm. There's always time for that. Always. Yeah, it's, it, and that really does speak to the investing principle, doesn't it? You have to create something to make more of it, right? Whether that's time, whether that's money, whether that's, you know, building your practice, profitability, you have to create some of it so that it can be used as fuel to generate more. Time's the same, right? Boom. Boom. I like it. I like it a lot. That's a great conversation, James. Thanks. I, I love the way you built on that. I, you, as you were talking through the kind of delegate, eliminate, automate, I, it, I was reminded of the um, Eisenhower Matrix. Okay. You know, the urgent, important matrix? Uh, yes, I've heard of the model, but you probably yeah. know more about the specifics than me. It's like urgent, urgent, non-urgent, something like this. It's like there's yeah. four, isn't it? It's yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a four yeah. blocker. You've got urgent, urgent and not urgent, important and not important. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you basically, you can, you, you know, your what you talked about, those five jobs, five kind of five things that are taking your time throughout the day. If you if if you if anybody Google's the Eisenhower urgent important matrix, it what it helps you to do in each of those boxes, you've got uh what do you do with it? So if it's not urgent and it's not important, you eliminate it, right? Why are you doing that stuff? But that stuff is scrolling through social media, which we talked about earlier, right? Reading that AI copy that's only going to keep reproducing stuff you love. So it's it's not important, it's not urgent, you shouldn't be doing it, eliminate it. Then you've got you know uh, urgent but not important, that stuff you kind of go, well, that's your, that's your delegate, right? Someone else should be doing that because yeah. it's it's urgent for someone, but not necessarily not necessarily important for you. Then you've got uh, important, not urgent, and that's your sweet spot, right? Urgent, sorry, not urgent and important, that's where you're going to make all your money. That's your reviewing at the end of the day because it's not urgent to do it, but it's important that you do it. That's reading. That's your clinical development, your business development. All of that work happens. That's your priorities. Um, and then the final box, which we haven't covered, which is kind of uh, not – so it's uh, so it's important not uh, and, and urgent, sorry – that you have to prioritize, just have to get on with that stuff. And if you can automate that stuff, then that's what that's where the sweet spot is. Love it. Justin, what a flipping awesome podcast episode. Thanks so much for giving up your Thursday afternoon. Hopefully the first of many podcasts, pleasure. my friend. Yeah, thank you, James. Dude, my absolute pleasure. Anything that you'd like to say in conclusion, just to wrap up? Yeah, I, I've really enjoyed it, James. Thanks so much. Thanks for, I, I love listening to your episode as well. I'm really delighted to have been a guest. Anybody wants to connect with me, it's Justin Lee, L-E-I-G-H. Feel free to reach out. I am active, as we said earlier, on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to you know connect, say hi. Uh, one other thing, if you don't mind, James, I also run a podcast called the Dentistry on Purpose podcast, and James is going to be a guest on season four. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so I'd love it. If anybody hasn't discovered it yet and you'd like to listen, then please feel free to, to look at that as well. And I'd love some feedback. So thanks very much, James. It's been great. Cool, man. Yeah, feel free to hit up Justin's podcast. Justin, thank you so much once more. We'll catch up again super soon. Yeah, look forward to it. Thanks, James. Take care.